1. I worked at this summer camp while I was growing up for about seven summers. I loved this camp, but there were some places that just creeped me out. This story takes place on the side of camp that is farther away from the main camp. There was a building and two camp units, campgrounds, where we would stay in Adirondacks. These are like small cabins, but one wall is completely screen. The unit I was staying in was called Trails End, the other, where three of my co-workers and campers were staying, Cimarron. I had some minor experiences all over camp, but this night was by far the most intense, and most of it didn't happen to me. We had finally gotten the campers quiet and in bed. They were young, so most fell asleep quickly. As I was climbing up to my bunk, I heard a small girl's voice say, Um, as though about to ask a question. Startled, I turned and my two co-workers looked as well. There was no one. There were no flashlights, there wasn't a camper, nothing. We didn't hear anyone walking up to the cabin. We would have heard the leaves crunching. Nothing. We all looked at each other and one of my co-workers spoke. We are going to pretend that was my stomach and go to sleep. We agreed. The next morning, we are in the building for breakfast and our three co-workers who stayed in the other unit, Cimarron, were talking anxiously amongst themselves. We ask what's wrong. Turns out their night got really weird really fast. These co-workers were some of the most level-headed staff, not really believing in ghosts. And really no nonsense. To hear this story from them shook me. All night they heard a voice go, Hey! All around their cabin. It would come from the left, then from the right, then another location. They didn't hear footsteps, trust me, if someone is there you hear them. And it wasn't a girl's voice, it was a man's voice. It was hoarse and rough. It got so bad they called all three main cabin staff, who were even more no bullshit than them. They stayed for about ten minutes before saying, you're on your own, and bailing. No one stayed in Cimarron the rest of the summer. The worst case, they stayed in Trails End or the building. But not Cimarron. The weird thing is, about a week or so before, I was in the unit as well. Different co-workers, different campers. But one night, one of the girls came over saying a campmate needed help. We have two major rules, no running and you have to have a buddy. She couldn't get a buddy to go with her, so she ran. She tried to run back, but I stopped her since it was dark and she could trip. I asked her why she was walking so fast. Oh, I just feel like something is following and watching me. I got chills. I looked around to make sure nothing was watching or following us. All I could see were tall, tall trees. I remember years ago before this, when I was a counsellor in training. Me and my campmates and our substitute counsellor huddled up in the unit's dining area, where there were at least screen walls. It had stormed, and that was the safest place. We all felt watched. Even after the storm ended, we stayed there out of fear and anxiety. Some of the units at the camp are weird, but Cimarron is and always has been the creepiest. 2. This happened several years ago, but is my one and only reason why I do believe that there's something else there. I was in Savannah, Georgia, a city which loves to profess its haunted nature. Working in the tourist industry hardened me to the unbelievable things that happened to people as they walked around downtown, because I knew that it was all just for the money. On a balmy spring day, just as the days were getting too hot to function, a close friend invited me to spend the night with her at a bed and breakfast on one of the islands, as the only guests they were supposed to have cancelled. And the owner of the house was out of town and needed her to watch over the house. This house was absolutely stunning, and had been built in the mid-1700s, a large wraparound porch, a gleaming kitchen, incredibly high ceilings, a beautiful carport and all surrounded by live oaks, covered with Spanish moss. They sold out during holidays and even a weekday night in their off-season, they charged nearly a hundred a night. My friend will call her A and the guy I was seeing will call him M. Had the house to ourselves for the entire evening, unless someone showed up unannounced. We got there around noon and explored the house a bit. 
there was a gorgeous grand piano in the dining room, which we were told was there from when they built the house. We three had gone into the master bedroom above the dining room and kitchen, and were just lounging about talking. The doors and windows were all open, letting the breeze run through the house, since there was no central heating or air, just window units. When M decided to go make us lunch, this was about two in the afternoon. He had left for about thirty minutes when we heard this incredibly beautiful singing, accompanied by a lovely, delicate piano playing. I looked at A and mouthed, wow. And we commented to each other that we both didn't know he could play the piano so well. We debated going downstairs to listen, but instead just stayed where we were, just listening and waiting for us. About ten minutes went by before we started to get antsy, because we were both hungry. We went down into the kitchen and M was right outside smoking a cigarette. We complimented him on the singing, to which he said he didn't know what we were talking about. Me and A looked at each other, puzzled, and explained what we had heard to him. He claimed he didn't even touch the piano and didn't hear anything. We went to the piano and the cover was still firmly in place, untouched. Because of this, we decided to just go and smoke ourselves out, while talking about the supernatural and paranormal. Because while it wasn't a scary event, we were still shaken. He did a little research, trying to find some connection about the history of the house. If I remember correctly, the owner previous was a member of the Savannah Philharmonic and a piano teacher. She died in the house after falling and breaking her hip, found by her family weeks later when the electric company complained about a late bill. He said that she heard the piano several times after that, when she was alone in the house during the middle of the day. 3. So two years ago I worked on trial for a branch of Hotel Hell. Basically, you have to work for free for them for four weeks before they decide if you're hired or not. It's all very sketchy as hell, and they take advantage of this, but I was desperate enough to do it. I worked the early morning shift from 5am to 1pm, and I mostly helped out in the kitchens, dining room, but as the hotel only had nine members of staff, three of which were managers who basically did nothing, I often got sent to different jobs in the hotel when and as needed. Now, I didn't exactly enjoy the job working eight hours a day for free with no break at all most days. Isn't exactly thrilling. But I settled into it well enough and I did my best to work hard. I wanted to be hired after all. One morning I was sent to the conference room to set it up. It was about 6am and we had a large tour group staying with us who had requested, rather than using the main dining hall, they have the conference room as a private dining room. Not so odd. We sometimes get requests like this. Breakfast didn't begin till 7am, so I had an hour to get everything ready. As I'm moving the tables, I notice a woman has walked in. She looked normal enough. Late 20s, early 30s, I'd say if I had to guess. Long dark hair, a white blouse, dark skirt, and dress shoes. The normal sort of guest we got. The door was left open so I could cart in the foods that didn't require cooking once I set up the tables. So I figure maybe she thought we were open already, as it was open, so I tell her that the dining room isn't ready, and won't be for another hour, and ask if there is anything I can help her with, and even offer to bring her one of the small pastries and a cup of tea, if she would wait in the main dining hall next door until we opened. But she stares at me blankly, not saying a word. I ask if she's okay. She continues to stare at me before she vanished in front of my very eyes. Now I was of course very freaked out by this. I later asked the head of housekeeping if she's ever noticed anything strange as she's worked here for 20 years and told her about my experience. But she told me that in no uncertain terms, the place was not haunted. This was not the last time I saw that woman. Another time I was on break and went to the ladies' bathroom. As I was washing my hands, I saw her in the mirror in the bathroom, also just standing. I turned around, but no one was there, and when I looked back into the mirror, her reflection was gone. That was the last time I saw her, but I knew the head of housekeeping was either lying so I wouldn't freak out and quit before my trial was up, or maybe she simply didn't know, but... Over those four weeks, many guests complained about footsteps in the halls or knocks upon their doors in the early hours of the morning 
despite no one being there when they opened their doors. In the end, I didn't get the job, and I can't say I was at all sad about that. Truthfully, I was glad to see the back of it. Ironically, their complete lack of care for employees was far more disturbing to me than the woman I saw. 4. This happened about five years ago at a cemetery called Restland, a little outside of Pittsburgh. The place is known for being haunted and just downright creepy. There is an urban legend about this statue there who's been called Walking Rosie. If you flash a light at the statue, she'll supposedly start walking towards you. A body of a young girl was also dumped there in the 70s. They still haven't found out who killed her, so there is something off about the place. Anyways, my friends and I were on a kick of searching for haunted places, and we decided to check out Restland because of the walking rosy legend. We went at night. I was in the passenger seat. My friend was driving. We stopped by a few random graves and decided we were gonna just look around. But before we could, the entire car lit up, like someone had their high beams on from behind. At first, I thought it was the cops about to tell us to get out of the cemetery. But then the engine of his truck started. By the sound of it, I could tell it was a truck. It sounded old, but very loud. Gravel and rocks were flying everywhere, like this truck was revving up to hit us. My friend in the back seat started screaming to go, and as we sped out of the cemetery, I looked behind us and there was no truck. There were no lights, nothing. This all happened in a matter of 40 seconds. Later on that night, we took my two friends home. They lived in downtown Pittsburgh, and myself and my other friend lived outside of the city. They lived in downtown Pittsburgh, and myself and my other friend lived a little outside of the city. The entire way back from Pittsburgh, the glove compartment in the car would open. I had to close it at least six times. It started to creep my friend and I out. The thought of something following us home had crossed my mind, but I didn't say anything. My friend ended up going back to her house, and I went back to mine. I was watching TV when she called me crying. She was panicking, and I could barely understand what she was saying. I raced over to her house, and she showed me her back. Her back had claw marks all the way from the nape of her neck to her hip. She noticed them when she was about to jump in the shower, but she told me her back didn't hurt at all. She ended up coming over to my place. We were so scared that we slept in the same room the whole night. Her and I went back to the cemetery the next day. We wanted to see if there was a logical explanation for this. And right where the car lit up, there were tire tracks, driving over the graves. We followed the tracks all the way up the hill, and then they just disappeared. Has anyone else had an experience like this? I hope I don't sound crazy, but I'd like to know about ghost cars. I've searched around, but can't find too much on the internet. 5. My name is Kelly. This is my first post on here. I'm hoping to get some insight on the following encounters. Something very serious, strange, and definitely paranormal happened to me in October of 2008. I will not yet disclose the full details of this occurrence unless you are fully interested to know and feel you can give me some insight. I will, however, give you a somewhat brief outline, or background about me, and assure you that I am by no means a fluke, crazy, or just looking for attention. I am a Christian, have been baptized, and fully believe in heaven and hell. I am a recovering alcoholic, but thankfully almost ten straight years sober. Back in 2008, I was almost a year sober when this occurrence happened. I was getting ready, fully healthy, for a trip to Maui, Hawaii, in November 2008 with a boyfriend at the time. I had previously been to Maui with a previous boyfriend in early August 2007. It was an amazing trip, but when I returned home was severely depressed and relapsed for a brief time. Then went to a treatment center to get sober. Fast forward to October 2008. I was completely sober and healthy mentally and physically. I was in my apartment complex's clubhouse exercising on the treadmill, when suddenly the TV and walls in front of me began to turn, and I felt spiders crawling under my t-shirt. 
and they crawled up in my shoulder and just sat there, as if friendly. Note I was not physically dizzy or suffering from low blood sugar. I was not out of breath, so nothing physically wrong with me whatsoever. I was, however, immediately charmed by the spiders, when normally if I would see an actual spider, I would have been scared of it. I was intrigued as to why the room had rotated right before my eyes, and somehow knew already this was something paranormal. But I was not scared, but simply charmed and intrigued. Next occurrence. I think the same day later on was when I was at my kitchen stove. I can't remember why, but the oven or stove was definitely not on or in use. I suddenly felt a warm, tingling sensation start at my feet and move clear up through my whole body until it reached my head. I remember loving the sensation and thinking, how cool, this is a friendly entity of some sort. My religious beliefs told me different, so I was conflicted. So just in case, I hung a wooden cross on my bed headboard and kept crosses in every room, and my Bible on my table. The next series of events lasted, I think, like three weeks. I won't yet go into great detail here because many, many strange and unexplainable things happened. I will try to sum it all up by telling you the following pertinent points. Every night while in bed I could see a large serpent or snake enter my bed under my covers. I could see the outline of it above my cover as it would start at the foot of my bed and slither clear up to me and physically lift the covers right at my chest. I could not actually see it but I certainly felt its tongue on my face. Again, I was not really scared for some reason, but charmed. I was verbally communicating with it during the day, usually later in day, when I wasn't at work. There was a beach bag on my door that I got from a previous trip to Maui. I would ask it questions, and it would raise up once for no, and twice for yes. My clothes in my closet would move too. And whenever I would take a bath or shower, it would open the door, move my loofah around, open the shower curtain, things like that. A couple times I physically felt hands massaging my legs. I would also still feel the spiders on me, which at first were nice. Then later on in the days ahead, they would start biting me and scaring me. I started to get locked in my apartment. Sometimes I would get so scared and call my mom, who was fully religious practically a saint herself. It was hard for her, but she was the only one who believed me, especially because several times when I would call her, it kept disconnecting our phone calls. She would read the Bible to me and pray with me. I remember being upset with God because even though I had a cross on my bed, the serpent still came. One night, probably two or three days into the seven-day trip, there was a luau at our resort. There were several tables of local and cultural arts and crafts. At the last table, there were these wooden statues and wall hangings. The local man approached me and told me the one I was looking at was named Ku. He said this statue was believed to ward off evil spirits. Sold. He even engraved my name into the wooden statue for free and said it would bring me protection. Now I was still a religious person and have learned to never worship idols. To me though, this was just a simple statue to be a decoration in my home. Plus I was desperate, no doubt about it. Now I shit you not here, the minute I purchased that damn statue, everything paranormal stopped. I could tell and feel that it was gone. I was relieved and ecstatic. I'm pretty sure I started drinking wine on the trip, telling my boyfriend that wine wouldn't affect me the way vodka did, but I was getting sad to leave Maui, and began sneaking little bottles of vodka from the gift shop. So by the time it was time to fly home, I was in full relapse mode, i.e. fully wasted. My boyfriend was not happy either. Upon returning home days later with the statue, my mom came over, I think she knew I was drinking again, because my boyfriend called her. She was more concerned though when I told her about the statue and how it made the evil demon go away. She asked to see it and when I gave it to her to look at, she told me that the damn thing was an idol and that's exactly what Satan wanted me to do. She took it from me and went and burned it somewhere. I remember being pissed mainly because I spent like $65 on the thing and thought it was cool. Sometime later I ended up in rehab again. Through much hell and anguish I did finally get completely sober again. Again I have now been completely sober for almost 10 years. That is great and I have not experienced anything paranormal like I did that month. But ever since then 
Many bad things have happened in my life. Sexual predators, jail, divorce, depression, etc. But don't get me wrong, I do have many blessings in my life too, primarily two beautiful little boys three and four years old, that I have full custody of, and my mom who has been even more of a blessing to me than I deserve. But there is still a dark cloud over me, I just know it. Bad things and bad people are attracted to me, like I'm a magnet for them. <sighs> this is why I'm at a point where I'm wondering why. I still think about what happened almost every day. It doesn't make any sense, but I know that it was real and did happen. I'm scared that maybe I've been cursed somehow by the devil, since technically I was totally touched in more ways than one, by something demonic or evil. I honestly don't think I was ever possessed, though. But probably close, as I did often feel like I wanted to die. Please believe me. And help me if any of you can. Or direct me to someone who can. Hey everybody, Hellfreezer here. And thank you very much for listening to 5 True Paranormal Stories, Episode 84. And thank you very much to everybody who allowed me to use their stories in this video. Well, I don't know about you guys, but I plan on having a very lazy weekend. So I might try and get Saturday's video at least done a bit early. We'll see. We'll see what it's like story-wise. <sighs> I think I just need to have a wee bit of a rest, so that's what I'll be doing this weekend. Keeping myself amused and doing as little as possible. And I hope you guys have the opportunity to do the same. And with that, I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.